Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jumbo, for the extremely flattering introduction. I'm not accustomed to that. Um, but it's great to be back here. I think last time I was here was maybe five years ago. Um, so yeah, I, I'll be presenting some, uh, some old things as, just to set some context and then transition into the absolute latest stuff that my lab is pursuing at Cornell Tech. And uh, this status bar seems to indicate that the slides are still loading. So hopefully, as I get to that slide, it will be uh, ready to go. Uh, so there are basically three projects I plan to cover. One, uh, Jumbo already mentioned, is Visipedia. And then a more interactive aspect of Visipedia that we call Snack. And then some uh, brand new stuff. OK. <laughs> Not sure what just happened there. You all get to see my to-do list that just decided to pop up. OK. All right. Uh, and then uh, some uh, very new work that we're doing involving augmented reality for tele-assistance. So the first part has to do with fine-grained category recognition. But instead of just trying to train machines to do it, we're doing it in a way that combines the expertise of humans and machines. So this has to do with capturing and sharing visual knowledge. If there are things where you want to learn uh, more about them, and you know the terminology, you know what to search for, then Google, as it exists, is a great way to do that, or Wikipedia. So if you just happen to know the technical terms for these different types of bills, then you can look it up and you'll find great information. If you don't know what they're called, then searching using a picture is obviously the best way to do it. But the problem is that traditionally, visual-based search is very generic. It would just tell you something like, yes, it's a bird. And apart from the novelty um, effect there, it's a little bit disappointing not to get more specific information. So what we want to do with Visipedia is capture and share fine-grained knowledge about these images. And a key to this is tapping into communities that have deep personal interest in these particular topics. So we all probably know someone who's really into butterflies or birds. We have some cousin who will 
travel around the world and spend thousands of dollars on equipment to take pictures of things. Uh, and they do it on their own time. And um, if you happen to mention something to them about that topic, they'll talk for hours. Uh, if you make the mistake of asking them about uh, moths and butterflies when they're actually into birds, you won't get anything, right? They, they're almost insulted. So if you happen to fall into that silo of great interest, you can get tremendous, in, in our terms, you could get tremendous amounts of training data, the images, the annotations, the typical confusions and things like that. So Visipedia is very much about operating at that interface between human and machine expertise. So it's useful to look at a breakdown of what's easy or hard for humans and machines. At a generic level, we would all agree on the left, it's pretty easy to answer yes or no to these different questions. Is this image showing a chair? No. Is it showing an airplane? Yes. So it's very simple to answer that. The uh, typical audience member here would have trouble providing a fine grain label for this. Um, is it an indigo bunting? Is it a blue ghost beak? Those are generally speaking, they're difficult questions. But if you're able to break it down into simple questions about parts and attributes, like is the yellow, is the belly yellow? Um, is the length of the beak shorter than the length from the eye to the back of the head of the nape? These are things that um, you make it easy for people to answer these questions in the same way that you would do it in a field guide or a classification key. So you take knowledge that generally requires expertise and you um, share it with a broader audience through these relatively simple questions. So that brought us to an approach <clears throat> that we call uh, Visual 20 Questions. And um, this block diagram, um, it was kind of a humbling exercise to create this block diagram because what we did was just put the totality of the field that I'm in into this little block here. So whatever, this was circa 2010. So just take um, the, the whole field of computer vision and put it in this block. And this is some posterior probability that's supposed to have a, a lar this bar plot should have a very large spike at the correct species of bird and all the rest should be very small. So we put in this bird X, run it through computer vision, if it worked perfectly, you'd have kind of a delta function and the rest would be very small. But um, the grad students here probably don't know this, but in 2010, computer vision did not work very well. So the best you could do was just better than random, and then you could use that to kick off a game of 20 questions. Just like you know, before cell phones, when people were on long road trips, they used to play games in the car, like. Uh, visual 20, but not visual, but they play 20 questions. So someone would just think of something, a geographical location, a type of food, and you just start asking questions. Um, so this probably still exists, but in an app, and each person in the car would be playing it on their own. Um, but in the case of visual 20 questions, instead of starting out completely uniformly at random, we would actually use this output of the kind of noisy computer vision system to kick off the game of 20 questions. So it would be biased toward the, a, a short list of birds that might match based on what the computer vision output. So we could do this by enumerating the set of yes or no questions. And in the case of this database of around 200 birds, um, that would be something like 330 yes or no questions would characterize each species of bird. And we can run this loop and select questions by maximizing the expected information gain. So out of all of the yes or no questions you could ask, they're not all equally informative. So when you condition on the output of the computer vision system, uh, then you would reach into this bucket, pull out a question that will based on your training data that would maximize expected information gain. And then each time you do that, you get this sort of tailored question and then you, you can narrow down um, to, to get a better result. Well, as I said, this was all before deep learning happened. And uh, I coined this term called anti-depluvian. Uh, it's based on a biblical term called anti-diluvian. Does anyone know what that term means? <laughs> yeah, it means before the flood. So anti-depluvian is basically before 2012. 
Um, so again, the grad students here don't cite any papers from back then, but it did exist. There was a time where people did things like, uh, you know, Jumbo mentioned shape context. Uh, there are also histograms of vector quantized filter responses. Um, so back then, that, that's what we were doing. Uh, lots of hand designed features. Um, so all the stuff inside that little box um, was just some kind of packaged up gradient with, with various tricks um, and nobody was using neural networks. Um, and then, so the first few years of Visipedia uh, were before the flood. And then of course we started doing work that looked like this. And um, I still, I think like many of my uh, colleagues from Jitendra's group back then, I resisted it. I thought there's no way that you just shove data into this thing. You still have to do some kind of pose alignment or part detection or something. So our first foray into deep learning for this was that we would still run a kind of deformable parts model style uh, part detector for the head and the overall body. And we would do some kind of alignment and warping and then run deep neural networks on each of those parts and then have some kind of um, softmax layer that's putting together the individual output. So our first approach here that was based on deep learning was applying the power of deep learning to these kind of normalized parts. I just thought the bird is too articulated. It would just be too difficult to do this. And we did actually have a record for about two weeks or something. Uh, where we were getting the best results. And then sure enough, someone just collected more training data and beat us. And basically that was the death of any sort of hand design feature we ever used um, in Visipedia. Um, so then what happened was it, it suddenly became a game of collecting high quality data. And when you wanna collect high quality data for fine grained categories, you have to go to the experts. And this actually ultimately is what brought me to the East Coast because I started collaborating with one of the best labs of ornithology in the world, which is located at Cornell. And so we put together uh, a really great data set called NA birds. Um, and it's got 700 species. Um, and it might not surprise you that uh, despite our best efforts to promote this newer, better data set, the first one we put together which was kind of a mess, it was called Cub 200. That's the one that everyone still uses if they're doing fine-grained uh, visual categorization. Um, and that's okay, it's a way of kind of getting your feet wet with bird recognition. But nonetheless, the people that are really um, vigilant about getting these uh, categories correct, um, we would direct them toward this, this data set, um, which has more species and it was the basis of this app we co-developed with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology called Merlin. So um, in the end, uh, you will still see in this web demo that there were some 20 questions, um, style questions in here. But in fact, the truth is the deep learning thing works so well that you barely ever have to ask any questions. Uh, is that good news or bad news? Not sure yet. We can save some of that for the discussion. So this Merlin app, which any of you can download for iOS or Android, uh, this is just showing the web version. You'd pick a photo. Um, in this case, there's more than one bird, and you draw a box around one bird. Um, again, at the time we implemented this, um, it would automatically ask you some questions, like click on the bill tip and click on the eye. This is no longer necessary, um, but uh, after that, if the, um, geotag and timestamp is not already in the EXIF data for the photo, it would ask you where you saw the bird and when you saw the bird. And then it looks at, um, at, a, at a resource called eBird, and eBird has historical data for bird sightings. Um, so you have a really excellent prior probability on sightings of birds uh, all over the world at different times of the year. It then generates a short list of possible matches. So this was your query. And then it pulls up a short list, which in this case was very short. It was just one. And um, it's ultimately left up to you as the user. So you would look at this, check out some thumbnails. If it looks correct, you'd click, this is my bird. And it would then play the bird song for you. It would tell you about the bird. Um, 
And it doesn't go straight into the training data for that bird. It would then get vetted by an expert at the Cornell Lab of O. And if they deem it correct, they would add it to the training data. And every quarter or so, we would retrain the models to make it better and better. Um, since doing this, we, um, we went with a kind of bird pack approach. So if you download the app, it automatically has North America. Uh, but these particular users like to go off the grid. And if you are doing a trip to a particular part of the world, you can just download a model for TensorFlow iOS or the Android counterpart, um, and you don't need an internet connection. You can just have all the birds of Scandinavia saved on your phone. So after years of working on birds, we had so many people asking us, can you also use it for mushrooms or for fashion, clothing, things like that? And that gave rise to a series of workshops that have appeared at CVPR. Um, we just did the fifth one last year uh, called Fine Grain Visual Categorization. And the last two times that we've offered it, we had a suite of competitions. And the, the flagship competitions are called iNaturalist and iMaterialist. And the iMaterialist name was a joke because I only wanted to do natural world, uh, but the corporate sponsors wanted to bring in um, sort of visual commerce stuff for like clothing and shoes. So I just nicknamed it iMaterialist and then they took it seriously and that became the other competition. Um, so I don't have pictures of that, but it's now a serious thing and it's broken into a furniture track and uh, apparel. And we just sent the proposal for FGBC6, uh, so hopefully that will get accepted. Uh, so iNaturalist is, is uh, iNaturalist, the nonprofit, makes an app um, also for iOS and Android. And prior to collaborating with Visipedia, it was just a social network where you could make observations of nature, and then you could put your own guess of, of what it might be, plant, animal, fungus, and so on. And then you would wait an average of two days or so until someone else that's on the iNaturalist network would see it and then confirm it. And if someone else confirms it, the record becomes something called research grade. So it's unconfirmed until someone else of a certain expertise uh, confirms it. So iNaturalist was already collecting quite a bit of research grade data, which then um, every week gets sent to a global registry called GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So all these different organizations that do citizen science ship their data to GBIF. iNaturalist is one of the biggest, along with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Zooniverse, and a number of other projects. So um, they were our first partner for this FGBC competition. Uh, we're now up to 8,000 species with them uh, with a long tail distribution, meaning that some of these species are not cited very often and some of them are cited all the time. Uh, and we also had these kind of niche competitions. Uh, this is with a Chinese company called Xingse, which has the international version called Picture This for flowers. Uh, this is with a Danish uh, mushroom um, research lab. This one is wildlife camera traps. So you can find at this workshop a lot of really interesting activity where people want to go beyond the generic. They want to know specific genus species and sometimes even more specific than that. Um, and sometimes these uh, differences are quite subtle, like these two ladybugs. This one only has two spots and this one has seven spots. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things you can do with these data sets like transfer learning, um, and making use of pre-trained models for different types of domains. And so I won't go into details there, but uh, there's really been an explosion of work in this so-called fine-grained area that has been complementary to what I think is the more mainstream deep learning kind of research involving um, general categories. So now, what I talked about so far was something where the focus was on multi-class classification. So these were cases for which if you could find the right expert, you would know the correct label. But sometimes people want to do visual search in a more exploratory way. You don't actually know the, the, the label for the data, but you'd like to discover something. And that could be useful for things like fashion or interior design. 
or it could be helpful for education purposes. So in the case of birds, ornithologists know all about bird anatomy. They know what all the parts and attributes of birds are called, but that doesn't mean that the average user on the street knows what those things are called. And the kinds of confusions that amateurs make between bird species might surprise experts in birding because they kind of know too much about the domain. So it can be really interesting to try to capture human notions of visual similarity, which you can then use for exploratory purposes or to try to get into the heads of students that are trying to learn about things and, and find out what they get confused about. And the kind of thing we're tapping into is this kind of triplet-based similarity where you make use uh, not of pairs, but at least of three. It could be more, but you need a minimum of three where you, you have constraints in the form where you'd say, um, so I don't know what this species is. Maybe it's a kind of owl. I also don't know what this is called. But what I can say is that this thing appears to be closer to that category than that one. So it's important that when providing this kind of response, uh, through a crowd work platform or just through a volunteer platform, um, no one is required to apply a semantic label. It's just a matter of saying this thing looks more like that thing than it does like that thing. And it's very easy to harvest large amounts of that information. It's comparatively more difficult to just get pairwise data. For example, this is something called a Likert scale. And you could just give some a someone a prompt. The statement is, these two foods taste similar, and we want you to click on this thing and say to what extent you agree or disagree with it. You can do that, but it's kind of tricky because as you go through a sequence of these questions, your opinion might drift. Um, you could just change your opinion later, or you might start stressing out about what two means or what three means. So there's some kind of calibration you have to deal with. Um, and then there's just these weird things like this is, you know, these both involve carrots, but in really different ways. So qualitatively speaking, it produces a, a cognitive burden on the user. Um, so when it comes to uh, triplets, um, then you can just say, well, uh, it's pretty easy to say that these two things look like they would taste. Now, keep in mind, taste is a non-visual thing. So we're requiring the user to envision the flavor of something for which they only have pixels. So we're asking you, uh, imagine you tasted this, this, and this. Um, just click on the one that you think would taste more similar. And it's actually relatively easy to collect that kind of information. And in fact, this is where um, we actually tapped into this nice property of the human visual system. So how many people here have used Mechanical Turk or any sort of crowd work platform? Okay, just one or two. Um, so there are these services where you can provide micropayments to um, a large group of enrolled users uh, for what are called HITS, H-I-T's, human intelligence tasks. So you prepare human intelligence tasks by the screen. So each screen that you present, the user has to click or type something. And it could be for correcting typos in OCR, fixing annotations on a map. So lots of big companies use this as a gigantic kind of atomic workforce to solve problems for them. Um, and you pay something that should work out to about minimum wage. So if you just put together an hour's worth of hits, then you'd pay the going uh, minimum wage for them to do this. What's interesting is that the human visual system can handle a lot of parallelism. So instead of just presenting a triplet, in which case you would have the, the anchor sitting here and then just two things over here, you can put a screen full where you have something like three by three, four by four, even as many as five by five, and instead you say, uh, I want you to click, I'm going to show you n images in a grid, and you have to click k of them. So it's an n choose k grid, and it's forced choice. You don't have to think about how many you're clicking. You would just say, here are nine images in the gallery. Click on the four that look most similar. And even if there aren't four, you still have to do it. 
All right, so you just click on them. And let's say that the user clicks on these. Now what we want are triplet constraints, but they just clicked on four things. And so we can rearrange this, and from that one screen we can pull out large amounts of triplets. So those triplet constraints are constantly telling us what things are closer to the anchor and what things are farther. So the part that's interesting in terms of human perception is that we found empirically that we can pay people exactly the same amount for a screen that has 25 stimuli in it as one that just has a single triplet. It feels like exploitation. However, we polled the Turkers and they said they enjoy it more when they get to see more pictures, <laughs> right? So from a computer standpoint, there's no shortcut. You would just have to analyze every image. And I'm not a visual psychophysicist, but I know that something rather remarkable is going on when people can look at this thing so quickly and just know what to click on. So we're able to save a huge amount of money because any of these screens, you just harvest large amounts of triplets and you get all these constraints. Now, going back to the, uh, this sort of more standard supervised multi-class classification problem, we all know about the typical deep learning pipeline that's kind of like this logistic regression thing preceded by a big nonlinear feature transformation, you know, subsampling, all this big black box of feature extraction followed essentially by logistic regression. That final softmax layer does a pretty good job of telling you cuisine type if you have enumerated it in advance. So if you know what these things are called, um, then you can get this classification. Now, it, it's typical that you would, um, if you want to do transfer learning or fine tuning or extend this to cuisines that previously weren't in your data set, you would peel off that last uh, layer and instead of treating it like a one-hop problem, you'd use the, the uh, so-called logits to get these, these raw feature vectors. Now, it would be nice if you did that and, um, and the off-the-shelf CNN features just automatically captured human perception of taste. It is possible that somehow in the pixels, a deep network that was pre-trained on ImageNet would just know some notion of similarity that captures um, human taste. But it's actually pretty unlikely that would be the case. Uh, there's a, just a lot of subtleties, like the state that the pizza is in, these strange things like guacamole and wasabi actually look quite similar. There are contextual cues, I think, that are obvious to most people here. If you've ever made this mistake, it's a grave mistake. <laughs> uh, but these, uh, the background here hints as to what type of uh, taste you're going to get. And then there's these things that, to me, this was quite surprising, um, there, that something as familiar and dear to me as a Kit Kat has incredible variation in other parts of the world with so many flavors that defy any sort of taxonomization, even of being edible. It's just interesting. Uh, these things, it, if you go back to this idea that you would have to write these all down and enumerate them in advance, you'd start to get into trouble. So we need something that's a little bit more flexible than that. And uh, I'll just skip that one. So the the snack idea, this stands for stochastic neighbor and crowd kernel, and it might have been influenced by the fact that we are working with food all the time on this. Um, the, the brief description, I'll give a brief description for people that are familiar with the underlying methods. So uh, it's basically putting together two approaches. The first one is something called T-SNE, student T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. So how many people have heard of that approach, T-SNE? Okay, maybe a third of you. So T-SNE is something that is very widely used to take high dimensional data and collapse it down into two dimensions, some kind of low dimensional embedding, and then you can see things like musical genre, or it could be um, things like for biometric purposes to see different biometric features that are clustered next to each other. So T-SNE is something that just takes something like thousand dimensional vectors that's really hard to uh, visualize and uh, just makes use of simple distance measures on them and then just collapses it down. And the student T distributed part gives it a kind of qualitatively nice spread in two dimensions so that it lends itself better to visualization. 
So this part of snack um, is standard T SNE applied to this penultimate layer of a deep network. And that on its own can produce a low dimensional embedding. But we have this other part that makes use of something called student T distributed stochastic triplet embedding, T ST. Okay, this is the lesser known sequel of T SNE. So T SNE used the high dimensional feature vectors and then did the embedding on those. T ST, how many people have heard of that one? Nobody, okay. Uh, so it's much lesser known. I think triplets are kind of underexplored in that respect. Because um, it's basically hard to get that kind of data. Um, so TSD makes use of the triplet constraints. And uh, that is not as abundant as the pairwise data that you get from the lower left pathway. Um, but we can combine these two things with weights so that the effect of the human preferences can exert a pull on the embedding that you get. So if this, say, represents a data set of 1,000 images of birds, you could get the T-SNE embedding without any human interaction at all. You just get that embedding. And then from the human channel, you get all these people clicking on similarities, uh, perceived similarities of, of birds or food or whatever you want. Um, and that can also give rise to an embedding. But you can put them together and turn this dial where you're going between these extremes of pure machine um, interpretation or pure human interpretation. Although we can't turn it all the way to pure human uh, interpretation because we just can't afford to collect triplets for every single data point. So it's like a very small, um, it's kind of a sparse uh, representation of the human perceptual similarity and then a dense representation of the machine's notion of, of similarity. So putting those together with a suitable weight gives rise to this embedding. And then we can take something like a data set of 10,000 foods and, um, and we do all those human experiments to capture notions of taste similarity. And if we zoom in, we can see some reasonable things like these appear to be desserts and pastries. So you see some of these uh, desserts that have berries in them uh, near one another. Um, and then we have um, something that looks like a waffle um, and other waffle-like things with fruit on them. So these things get pulled together in a pretty reasonable way. But in a more quantitative way, what's interesting here is that uh, you can actually use this notion of perceptual similarity to do quality control. So you might have polled experts to get lots of data on a fine-grained, lots of labels on a fine-grained data set. But maybe they were doing this late at night and they just made some mistakes. So one of the birds, they just mislabeled by accident. Well, you can actually use large crowds of annotators who don't know anything about birds to discover that something is an anomaly. So if you took that snack embedding for all those birds and then you color coded it with the ground truth that was provided by the experts, then you would expect to see essentially clustering uh, according to each of those bird species. But then you might see something like this blue point that's surrounded by quite a few pale green points. And then you'd say, well, that's odd. Um, the crowd workers, OK, they didn't know the species of the bird, but they still have a functioning human visual system. And for whatever reason, their notion of similarity put that particular bird into this zone. So that means maybe that expert should go in there and take a look at that data point. And when we did that, we found out that that was actually mislabeled. So the, the expert looked at it and said, oh yeah, I don't know, what, I just must have hit the wrong key. Okay, so they know the species of that bird. But the Turkers that were doing all the clicking on the triplets and grids, they didn't know what it was, but it just looked different and, and got, um, discovered by virtue of that. OK, so now I'm going to switch to the third part, um, which on the surface has no connection because it has to do with augmented reality. But I still think it has a connection because uh, when we started Visipedia, 
we were largely doing our work on laptops and desktop machines, and you'd have big fo digital photo albums. You'd go on a trip taking pictures of nature, and then you organize your photo albums and um, maybe run those through a computer vision system. As Visipedia progressed, this became the device that people were using to capture the natural world around them. And progressively, these things started to get more powerful, and then they have their own version of augmented reality. Some call it augmented reality, some just say it's on-device computer vision, but you could turn this thing on in an always-on processing mode and actually just move it around and classify mushrooms and things like that. Now, here, in terms of my, the priorities for my lab, I think, I don't claim to know which um, hardware is gonna win, whether it's gonna be something that looks like glasses or it's on a hat or a lanyard or, or what, but I'm increasingly convinced that the way we will consume the results of computer vision and machine learning uh, will not happen by taking this out of our pocket. I think it will happen through an augmented reality medium, and it could be projected AR, it could be something minimal that we see in our glasses, or it could be something like a Magic Leap or HoloLens headset. So I, I warn my PhD students I could be wrong. Maybe they should just keep developing for uh, mobile phones, but this is where we have decided to go. And the thing, our, our first foray into this direction is something we call Pointar. Now, this uh, categorically falls under spatial augmented reality. It's a physical pointer. It's, it's kind of retro in that respect. It's going back to the 70s. It makes use of a five milliwatt laser and actual little servo motors. And uh, just to highlight, for those of you that aren't familiar with this terminology, um, the mixed reality spectrum over here, we've got the real environment, which we're sitting in now, as, at least as far as we know, we're sitting in total reality here. Um, and then the other side, if you put um, this, like a video see-through device right in front of your eyes, like an Oculus Rift or something, that's 100% virtual environment, that would be VR. Um, and then as you move along the spectrum, it's really a question of how much of what you see is the real surface in front of you and how much of it is rendered pixels. So generally speaking, augmented reality is where most of what you see is reality and then you're superimposing um, graphics on top of it. And then the lesser known term, augmented virtuality, is when you're wearing a VR headset, but in selected areas, you're actually letting through things from the real scene around you. Examples of that could be avatars. So if you're talking to a friend who's rendered as an avatar, you could do this very creepy thing where just the head lets through the actual appearance of your friend. Um, so that would be augmented virtuality. And there's also things like diminished reality where you want to remove something from a scene and so, and so forth. So we're operating here and um, the, the laser would count as projective. So things like uh, HoloLens and Magic Leap and Meta are instances of optical see-through. Um, so your eye is here, you're seeing the real world and then a combiner presents some sort of um, overlaid image. Uh, then there's video see-through. Um, and you can already imagine some of the pros and cons here in terms of um, how much control you have over the environment, issues involving lag, uh, and so forth. And then there's good old projective, which I think is kind of considered stone age and overlooked, but you're actually projecting stuff right onto the screen, uh, right onto the uh, world around you. So the, the domain where I'm, I'm most uh, interested is te tele-assistance. Um, and I got into this through assistive technology, which is helping visually impaired people perform tasks like shopping and so forth. But more broadly, there are always things where we can use help from people who may not be right there with us. So maybe you're uh, living away from home for the first time and you need help um, fixing something. Um, so. Uh, typically, when people present such a thing in an augmented reality context, um, they, I, I, in my opinion, they overdo it. Um, they're sort of uh, presenting these rich 
uh, graphics, scene aligned, um, and kind of getting really fancy. Um, but we want to strip it down to some of the most basic aspects of helping someone remotely. Uh, think of a case like you're helping an elderly parent uh, with a computer problem. Um, there's a lot of technology out there. You could start a FaceTime call or a Skype chat or something like that. And, and that really takes care of the part where you are communicating and you can see the other person. They could show you the thing where they're attempting. It's like telling them hit any key. What is any key? What does that mean? Or like on the back of the router, what, which is the cable I'm supposed to remove? So the, the, the talking part is really well addressed through current technologies. The part that's really missing is pointing. Just being able to reach through the device and say, hit this key, pull out that cable and plug it back in. That is not something that requires fancy leaping dragons coming out of the water and stuff like that. You just need to point. And I insist that the field of augmented reality is missing the point. I think they're focusing way too much on crazy graphics and entertainment stuff. And it's really about capturing this action, being able to put a dot on something. Essentially, like for those of you that know about AR stickers, you've seen AR stickers in Snapchat. You've probably seen them in measuring apps and stuff like that. We simply want to make an AR sticker in real life, a laser that you just a remote person can just put their finger on something, uh, like someone remote is helping this person uh, fix a circuit breaker panel, and they just want to be able to see what's going on there, and on their remote device, touch a point, and make sure that when that person's moving around, that that dot stays there. Chances are we've all seen something like that with a mobile device, the notion of an AR sticker, but you know, call me picky, but I just don't want my hand occupied holding this thing while I'm doing it. And besides, there's nothing quite like looking at, the, at physical reality and seeing something projected on top of it. So we prototyped this. Um, at the time, this was Things, um, a beta version of Things, but Android Things is now in version 1.0, and we're using a, a Pixel phone. And uh, at the time, this AR core and AR kit was kind of brand spanking new, and now it's being used all the time. Um, so the basic idea here, is, what we're focusing on is this, um, this part down here. So we're collaborating with a startup company called Stream. And Stream takes care of the part of finding the expert, the electrician, the plumber, um, and so forth. So we're not, that's sort of the business part, not really the academic part. So here, what we're saying is, Take the Stream app, which operates totally within the device and um, has the notion of the AR sticker, but externalize it. Make an actual laser pointer that can point to, um, to the thing that you're attempting to fix. So this is a snapshot of it, and it's got a pair of servo motors and the five milliwatt laser. And um, so when you look at this thing running, so this is an early test where um, this version doesn't, sorry about that. This version of Pointar actually doesn't have a camera. It's just running AR core on the device. And as you move the cell phone around, it is seeing the coordinate system of that camera. And then the AR core is just telling it which uh, pan and tilt setting to move to to follow the effective location of the phone. So it appears that this is following it based on a camera, but it's actually just based on the, the inverse pose computation of this phone. So this is simply running AR core, and this is following it. So this is an early prototype with the actual laser. One thing it doesn't capture is the fun whirring sound of the motors, which is just something that I also miss when using uh, regular augmented reality. I don't know about you. Um, so um, this is a more updated version where now we have the camera integrated. Um, and so so here's a case where we, we pick a target 
um, and the, the target is actually the camera itself or something just like a centimeter below the camera. So the idea here is that the user is holding, oh, you get to hear the whirring sound now. You hear that? Um, so the idea is that as you move this thing, it's just attempting to keep that point shining at the same spot, all right? So it's, it's a pretty elementary thing when it comes to just purely software um, AR stickers, but doing that mechanically is a bit more complicated. Uh, the cartoon I showed earlier, uh, that's just a concept right now, but we eventually plan to do this with micro mirrors, which are increasingly low cost, like small LCD, LED projectors have these little tiny tiltable uh, MEMS mirrors that would eventually allow this thing to be done uh, like really small. Um, but there's a certain charm, like you could imagine like doing food preparation on a, on a kitchen island or something and having this little device that's just moving around. It's like cut the cucumber or like slice this thing um, at like a sort of kitchen assistant. So uh, this is just a snapshot of what the mobile interface looks like um, so that the remote user would tap on, on a Lego brick and then they would see the rendered um, hit detection here and then um, you can see uh, like where it's supposed to shine and then this dot is where it's actually shining and then you can close the loop like you run a laser point detector, find the error and correct it. Uh, but since doing this we actually got slightly more expensive servo motors so we're not making uh, as big errors here. So as I mentioned this is really something that's just getting started and um, the, the students that approach me that want to work on augmented reality are surprised that it's so little augmentation, but I treat it almost like a minimalist martial arts thing, like you show me what you can do with one dot, right? Like I will give you a budget of, of a set of measure zero. That's all you get is one dot to project onto the screen and show me what you're able to do. And if you do a good job on that, I'll give you a little circle. Uh, maybe a little arrow, maybe you can you know, paint out a word, but my point here is that we're not lacking for fancy augmented reality stuff, but we're definitely lacking for useful augmented reality. And there's so much you can accomplish just by putting dots and scenes, but putting dots and scenes requires understanding the scene. Uh, so we have our first, we um, had a demo at uh, Embedded Vision Workshop at CVPR. Um, and we're putting together more formal papers on this type of work now. And uh, so that brings me to the end. I just want to thank um, Google for supporting pretty much all of Visipedia. Um, and a lot of this work was done in collaboration with Pietro Perona's lab at, at Caltech. And these are the collaborators for the uh, augmented reality work. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> uh, it seems that a lot of the work you uh, developed a very uh, fine grained understanding of what the function approximation and classification human can do uh, is distinct from its kind of focus. I wonder if you think there's some way of reverse engineering and developing hypotheses about what it is that can be done to learn how to do that. It's going to be a long time before we understand human architecture, so let's not go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to make sure I get it, if we take something like snack, I had that claim at the beginning that you needed both pathways. And then I think that a, a pure machine learning researcher would look at that and, and have the impulse to fix it and say whatever it was you were getting from the human pathway, capture that stream, learn from it, make the automated features better, and now you don't need the human part anymore. So. Yeah. 
So, yeah, so there's a part of it that I think I have to confess a bias, which is that Visipedia is so much based on harnessing human knowledge, and I have so much respect for those human communities that I tell every community I approach that almost like an article of faith, I tell them, your knowledge of mushrooms will never fully be captured by a machine. The last mile is always gonna require some kind of human expertise. Even if it's expertise that you just conferred to a, an average user, but I still believe that that last part's gonna need um, the human expertise. Now, they see the state of deep learning, the, the breathless press releases and stuff like that, and then when those experts try it, they get disappointed. So the part I think, I guess, the, the gut reaction I have is that once you can tee up the problem, then there's enough deep learning and big data that, where you can turn the crank and they'll just start to achieve human performance. Um, it could be for skin cancer, breast cancer, whatever. You, you, you set it up so that you got tons of data, everything's annotated. And so that may be overly optimistic on the machine learning side, but I think what it comes down to has to do with ability to learn with very few labels. So I feel like I don't have a good answer in terms of um, in, in terms of the capacity of deep learning and how it would prevent them from capturing certain types of functions. It's more like if you're able to use brute force and solve it, then inevitably that will happen. But the question is, what is your appetite for doing that for the tens of thousands of verticals that exist? And does that I can't help but just think of it as intellectually unsatisfying and that there just has to be a better way. Uh, but I'm not claiming I know what that is and I'm completely content to have humans handle that part. But I, I haven't yet arrived at some crisp statement of, of what deep learning's blind spot is because it is so effective at the brute force thing. Yeah, I, I think, so it's, all the things you mentioned, I think are, are bread and butter of spatial augmented reality. So I think, I think of the laser pointer as a transitional step, just the ability to show, uh, if, if you imagine you have a meal kit like Blue Apron or, or one of those things where you get the box and you set out all the food. Um, 